Good morning and welcome to Woodland Baptist Church. We're so thankful that you're with us this morning. We pray your day is going well, that you've had a good week uh, in the Lord and he, you have seen him, watched him at work around you and experienced him in, in new and in wonderful ways. As we begin this morning, we are reminded that Woodland Baptist Church, we believe the most important thing is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so as each of us embrace that, our own personal relationship. We have a collective strength, a collective encouragement that, that comes around us. And we can see that in our prayer life example as well. Whenever Jesus teaches us so much about agreement and coming together and praying for one another as Paul so often encouraged those churches he was writing to, as well as for those churches to, to pray for him. And so this collective uh, coming together in, in prayer that we can have, again, we begin to shape how important our personal relationship with Jesus Christ is because others are, are at stake around us. Our investment in the Lord personally has a good impact upon their life as we walk together in Christ. But only does that take place in a horizontal way when it comes to our relationships to Christ, but we are reminded when it comes to prayer and the agreement that we also have strength and partnership when it comes to vertical relationship with God, that uh, he can help us to know how to pray and what to pray, uh, even during times of struggle or difficulty or just praying with someone and for someone when words may not tr uh, readily be available to us of how to direct our prayer. So we're encouraged this morning in Romans 8 when it says, In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, working with us as well, praying for us and with us as we pray. And uh, he, he knows exactly how to pray. He knows God's will. And so being in step with him helps promote our prayer life in such a positive way with great hope as we do that. And maybe this morning as we begin uh, praying, you need a time of prayer, your life for someone else, your life in your own world that you're going through. Let's begin with coming to the Lord as we begin our worship experience, confident that as we pray, our partnership with each other and our partnership with the Trinity, with God, is also unfolding and giving us great hope to anticipate His answer, His will being worked out. Will you join me as we pray? Our Father, we give you this day. And we thank you so much for what you have in store, what you can uh, unfold and unpack for us, even where maybe we have already begun to think. Uh, your mind is going even way beyond that for us and with us this morning. And so, Father, for our own personal needs in our world and in our family and uh, on our street and uh, around our lives, Father, we just come to you united in agreement thanking you for the partnership that we share together as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ we also thank you for the partnership that takes up our place whenever we come short with knowing how to exactly walk with you and exactly what to verbalize as we pray so we thank you for the spirit of God that dwells within us to lead us and direct our prayer with those groanings and with those uh, Un unintelligible words to voice to you on our behalf exactly what you want said that will be in step with your will and your purpose for each situation. And so, Father, we thank you for the confidence and comfort uh, that we gain this morning as we pray and look to you. Thanking you for hearing each heart this morning, each concern lifted to you. You know them so well individually, and so we thank you for what you're going to do. Just help us to be attentive now, looking, anticipating what you're going to do next. And we thank you in advance for that. Father, just guide our time of worship with music and song as well as in your word. And we thank you for what, again, you will do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we look at God's Word this morning, please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, and we'll read a couple of verses there, and we'll skip over 
uh, to Luke chapter 10 and read the first verse there. And so maybe have your Bible handy. We'll be kind of uh, referencing the other passages and verses in chapter 9. I uh, may not be reading all of them, but I'll work to at least share with you the verses so you can uh, look at them uh, as uh, the message uh, unfolds itself. And so uh, we want to just kind of see that there's a correlation between these two moments that Jesus sends out others uh, uh, to, with, to be empowered and with authority to do uh, his work, that he's just not doing this himself, but he seeks to be training and, and developing disciples and those that have come around him. And so he gives them opportunity to kind of be empowered, given authority to do the work that he's been uh, doing, and they've been viewing, and they've been watching. And so uh, let's see how God maybe can speak to us about these two moments and how they maybe unfold it from God's perspective to see maybe how that can influence our lives today. So Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. And he called the twelve together, and he gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. We then see some further instructions uh, Jesus gives them about what to take and what not to take, how to move uh, from house to house. But we see the three things that uh, he gives them the authority and power to do uh, over demons and heal diseases and to proclaim the kingdom of God as they perform uh, the healing uh, that he has sent them to accomplish. But then we see chapter 10, verse 1. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others, indicating that they're not the 12 disciples. Appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your heart today and for your wanting to speak to us. We thank you the Holy Spirit's already working to accomplish again much beyond what we could uh, imagine this morning. And we thank you for the great possibility that's endless and again uh, gives so much hope and perspective for our hearts and lives today. Uh, may again you touch us and see how your word speaks to us today. May we be willing to follow, obey, and uh, apply the things that you share with us in Jesus' name. Amen. In team sports, there's usually a designated place where those that uh, are not playing, they're uh, substitutes or they're waiting for their part of the uh, game of, that, of the team that they're on, like in football, offense is out there, so maybe they're a defensive player, but they're on the sideline. And so uh, you have these places called the bench and where they sit and uh, they can rest and uh, sit down with their coaches maybe and kind of get... Uh, realigned and reassessed about what's about to take place, reminding them of, of, of the game plan uh, in basketball. Uh, on on, on the, its court, you also have a place called the bench where the starters are out there playing, but the substitutes, they're, they're on the bench and they're looking to be called upon, ready at any moment if there's some injury or uh, uh, their fellow teammate gets in foul trouble or whatever begins to take place. That Again, they're on the bench. They're close by. They're not in the game, uh, but they're, they're ready to, to go if needed. It's that idea that I want us to think about this morning that may be taking place when it comes to the disciples, the 12 disciples. Again, we see Jesus gives them great authority and power. And uh, didn't read all the story, but things go very well for them as they uh, begin to flesh out with that power and authority that Jesus gave them uh, to accomplish great things in preaching, uh, in healing, casting out demons. And so they... they they, they do that. By the time we get to chapter 10, uh, Jesus is sending out again, as we read, 70 others. Now, let me just quickly say, your Bible may say 72 others. And so the numbers are there, kind of, uh, if it's a scribal issue that, that took place that makes that difference between 70 and 72, uh, there's analogy back to that's the number of of the Sanhedrin, sometimes you could count 70 of them, 72 if you count the high priest and that's included. Or Anyway, just different things are brought to what maybe 70 would mean why Jesus would choose that number, or 72, why Jesus would choose that number uh, to do that. But just to give some definition and understand it, I read 70, your Bible may say 72. But uh, it's definitely others. So what 
has taken place? Is Jesus just ready to expand? Uh, he's just enlarging the circle that, of those he wants to give that, that opportunity and, and experience to. That could very well be the case, and that is definitely accomplished, again, like the first 12 disciples sent out. If you keep reading chapter 10, the 70 that went out, they too experienced wonderful uh, success in how God uh, worked through them and accomplished very much for the kingdom of God uh, through their lives. And so pretty neat to see. But is there also another part? Is there another underlining reason why Jesus would need to send out 70 others? I would like for us to, to explore that by thinking about some of the things that we see that take place in chapter 9. That maybe Jesus uh, wants to put the disciples on the bench. Uh, they've been the, in the starting lineup, as, as it were. But because of how some things begin to unfold, some things from Jesus' side uh, that he now introduces and brings into the uh, work of him being uh, going to the cross and him molding and training them. He introduces some new material. Uh, but then you see the disciples and where they are at after having that wonderful uh, authority given to them and seeing the wonderful things that took place. We begin to see some things that uh, surface in their heart that also may be pulling it all together while Jesus would say, okay, disciples, uh, sit over here for a while. Uh, just, just, just let, let's pull you from the game, as it were, and sit over here, and I'm going to send out 70 others. I would like to propose that's where Jesus is maybe also wanting to teach us and help us, as he did the disciples, that maybe we too, there's moments in our life that we need to go to the bench. Uh, we need to sit down, pull ourselves out, uh, and get back to, to the perspective where we need to get get some listening to our coaches, uh, rest a little bit, whatever it might be, so that we too can uh, gain a better perspective than maybe where we have landed as where the disciples have, have ended up. And so let's go back in chapter 9 and look at some things. First of all, from Jesus' standpoint, first of all, he introduces the cross. In Luke 9, 23, we see this cross lifestyle given to us. He says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Jesus had never mentioned anything kind of like that, a cross, and that kind of idea when it came to following him and denying your, your, yourself. Jesus had just asked the disciples, who do you say I am? Peter uh, gave the right answer uh, that he was the Christ, the son of the living God, that he was indeed the Messiah, the one that was anticipated, the one that was looked forward to. And so Jesus from that standpoint introduces something new into their growth, into their understanding of what it would mean now to be a follower. Following Jesus was, was not just seeing great things take place in feeding people, uh, in seeing storms calm down and all those things. Yes, that's definitely part of the story. And that's definitely great things that, that Jesus can do. But now we begin, begin to see another layer, a deeper dynamic begin to take place. And it's this cross lifestyle. And so maybe one reason Jesus sent out 70 others is that Jesus was introducing a cross lifestyle that the disciples were slow to begin to address and to incorporate and assimilate into their lives. Jesus also, we see in chapter 9, verse 51, that he set his face toward Jerusalem. Luke 9, 51. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Determined, uh, resolute, focused. And of course, Jerusalem would be the location. It would be the city uh, where he would uh, give his life, or he would enter at first very triumphantly, very welcoming, but at the end, uh, being cursed, being put on a cross, put to death, all these things. But yet Jesus, doing his Father's will, accomplishing it, accomplishing his father's purpose we see him moving that direction so that's also in this chapter chapter 9 that uh, he introduces the cross and the lifestyle of those who would be his followers need to also embrace that cross kind of living for, for themselves that he has set his face toward Jerusalem that he himself is going to an actual physical cross. He's actually going to go through moments where he's going to be suffering, that he's going to be denied, and he's going to be betrayed and arrested and all these things. And so that, is, that now comes into the uh, 
narrative and into the story that that's unfolding, but also Jesus teaches the cost that is involved in following him. In the final paragraph of chapter 9, in verses 57 through 62, it seems to be uh, those that are around in the crowd maybe. And uh, one says, I'll follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. And Jesus says, well, that's, that's, I'm, that's, that's good. But you got to understand uh, that I have no place to lay my head. You know, even foxes, they, they have a place that they can call home. And so Jesus doesn't have that. So, yeah, going wherever that's that's great giving kind of a blank check but please understand that it's all not going to be good it's all going to be kind of uh some difficulty will be involved along the way and so uh just make sure you have that in your understanding so jesus tries to calm down sometimes our open-ended zeal that we that we may be expressing some sometimes when it comes to being attached and w being willing to follow jesus jesus uh beats another one he says well let me go bury my dad first and then after that's done i can i can come follow you and jesus was gave said no priority that even when it comes to family responsibilities sometimes when it comes to following jesus uh, those things need to be set to the side and others need to take care of those responsibilities but i've called you and i've directed you and so the cost of following uh, jesus comes with a priority that even over other good things uh, when it comes to following jesus he still has our first priority to do that another one to go back home and tell his family goodbye. And uh, Jesus said, well, when you put your hand to the plow, it's best to keep moving forward. Don't go back to those that maybe who are not believing in Jesus and they would begin to try to trip you up or try to keep you from going and, and those things. No, it's best just to keep moving forward in calling. Uh, when he calls you to follow, that you you do that and uh, that maybe the, the, the goodbyes and those types of things can happen later or that's just not need, that doesn't need to happen at all. But here Jesus in this final paragraph really underscores cause. It may not be what you expect. Uh, the, the rearrangement of your life as you know it will begin to need to take place. So Jesus introduces these three things that are pretty strong, uh, pretty new, and yet they're now on the table. Uh, when it comes to the disciples and what they need to understand about their life and what it has meant now to be a follower and disciple of Christ. We flip it over. Why did Jesus send out 70 others? Now let's see from the same chapter some events that unfold where the disciples or some of the disciples, uh, we begin to see some things take place that maybe would help us to understand why Jesus would say, let's go sit on the bench. Let's take a time out. Let's, uh, let, let's, let's put some others in the game, and you come over here, and, let, and, let, and let's talk about it for a while. Now, as we do this, let's remind ourselves of verse 1 and verse 2, that Jesus gave them authority and power to do what? Well, to cast out demons, to heal, uh, to proclaim the kingdom of God. Those great things they were commissioned to do, and they had success in doing that. So as we see that, now let's see some of the things that begin to take place from the disciples' standpoint. Well, now they're unable to cast out a demon. We see in verse 40 of chapter 9, after Jesus and Peter, James, and John come back down from the mountain where Jesus had been transfigured, there seems to be a crowd gathered, and a father steps up to Jesus and says, I brought my boy uh, to be healed, and I brought them to your disciples, and they could not cast out the demon. And so... Though they had earlier success when Jesus gave them authority to do that, now we see uh, their inability, their ineffectiveness to do that. I think that needs to speak to us. Uh, Any time in our life where God has used us and in power, then it's not. What's beginning to take place? Why has that shifted in our life? We also see the disciples uh, take up a discussion that as Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem, and we know what that has involved, and we covered those thoughts just a moment ago. But now here is Jesus uh, traveling with his disciples, and Jesus, Jerusalem, cross, lay down my life, all these things. Here we see the disciples are arguing about who is the greatest. In verses 46 through 48 of chapter 9, it says an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name 
receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. So here Jesus begins to, again, give another teaching as the disciples kind of probably surprising to us, begin to discuss maybe what position they're going to get, uh, how they're going to be ordered or some hierarchy of position and why they should be chosen versus why they think they should be chosen for whatever roles or responsibilities. Again, not much is given to us exactly what they were talking about, but who was the greatest of them that were gathered there and, and what position and th those types of things may be involved because of them thinking they were the greatest. And so again, we see uh, that conversation that's moving across their heart and their life. Again, maybe going back, wow, we can do this too. Uh, Jesus not just watching him do it, but now we can do it. And so maybe it's kind of going to their head a little bit as far as what they've been able to be a part of and to experience. And again, we see the contrast of them having that discussion and Jesus having that heart of what it means to set his face to Jerusalem and what that means for his life there is letting it go, laying it down. And then the disciples are talking about being raised up and wanting to, uh, the prominent place. How different, opposite, polar those two conversations, those two directions we see taking place in chapter 9. But also we see the disciples stop someone who is healing in Jesus' name. In verses 49 and 50, <clears throat> Uh, we see this uh, begin to understand that uh, they saw someone casting out demons. Uh, that was in Jesus' name. And we told them, hey, you don't need to be doing that. But Jesus responds, do not hinder him, for he who is not against us is for us. So we see this begin to take place as well. But again, knowing the history now, disciples were able to cast out demons and heal now we see that when he come down from the Mount of Transfiguration, a father who has asked for that, it's not been able to happen. Jesus has to step toward that. He tells them how unbelieving they are to be in that place, how long is he going to put up with them. And so he has to take over and, and do that. And now we see even, even more being added to that problem because now there's someone that's not even really in their group. Uh, that's not really, you know, assembled with them, maybe not really been following Jesus, even from uh, the more crowd kind of standpoint. But here he is, and he's being used by God in such a way, uh, sharing in Jesus' name for those to be made well, and things are going well, And but they stop. Like, if you're not up here, then you shouldn't be doing that. And yet Jesus gives teaching and correcting there as well. And so the inclusive nature of those that are being used by God and being open to those that though maybe they're not in our church or maybe though they're not in our corner of society but God is using them in some way we need to be receptive that still God is going to the kingdom can grow and, and, and develop it doesn't mean that they're maybe where they fully need to be but still their opportunity that God has given to them is furthering them and to receive that they are more on our side than against us and then finally, Jesus wanted to destroy, excuse me, disciples wanted to destroy a Samaritan village. Uh, Jesus set his face. He's headed to Jerusalem. That kind of gets known or is understood whenever Jesus is going through Samaria uh, to get to Jerusalem. And as he's going that way, this particular village will not allow Jesus to pass. And so they kind of uh, raise up bow up and don't, don't want that, that to happen. And so in response to that, we see James and John begin to step toward for their Lord and uh, who, who they love and just ask, do you want us to send fire down upon, upon this village and we'll, and we'll show them a thing or two for them to treat you that way, which shouldn't happen again? Yeah, they, they would have been much better off to receive Jesus for sure. But Jesus again has to correct. Jesus again has to step in to say, that's not what we're about at this moment. Uh, so we're just going to quietly go and move to the other side. And we see in verse 56 that they just went on to another village where they would be received and they would be welcomed and needed a break or needed a meal or something like that. And so we see, again, Jesus needing to move the cross the disciples. And again, another example where Jesus is on one side and the disciples are on another. Greatness, going to a cross. Uh, Healing, 
that was there is not. And now Jesus is able to extend healing and step in and take care of that. Uh, we see welcoming those that are uh, against, uh, not really with them or in their group by Jesus, but yet the disciples are uh, kind of against that. and don't. So everything is on the other side. They're, where Jesus is yes, they are no. And uh, just the separation, the polarization that we're seeing between these two uh, develop in chapter 9. All this, I believe, becomes evidence, becomes the understanding of why Jesus would say in chapter 10, in verse 1, that he sent out 70 others. That for the disciples, they had become so disoriented. That for the disciples, though they were successful and used by Jesus and with his authority to do great things, that they it had gone to their head. We're now having conversations about greatness instead of being like a child. That we have moved forward and not seen uh, the truth of what those are doing around us. That though they're able to do things that we no longer can and we're trying to correct them and take care of that and Jesus is saying no that heart is not again correct here uh, casting fire down on the Samaritan village no the best response is let's just move on uh, let's go to another place we later see in Acts Philip is in a Samaritan village and maybe it's overlapping with what we see here and great salvation comes instead of being consumed by fire and destroyed we see ultimately maybe salvation come to the same location later on in the uh, working out of God's goodness for those that would, would, would receive him later. So all these things are taking place and, uh, God, and Jesus is having to work so hard uh, to work with them and to continue to teach them. And so now others are sent out. It's like, okay, disciples, let's go to the bench. Let's go and sit down. And maybe you and I need to go to the bench. You and I need to sit down for a little bit and uh, hear our Lord speak to us or to spend some more personal time with him in prayer and Bible study to get reoriented back to what it means to be his follower. That with this new material of a cross, that that is where we're really headed if there's going to be greatness, it's going to be greatness through serving. It's going to be greatness through letting your life go. It's going to be greatness through surrendering. It's going to be greatness through being small and, and humble like that child and those types of things. That's where greatness is. And again, the disciples now need to understand with this new material of a cross lifestyle, this new material of cost that's involved in being a disciple that expressing themselves like probably they know or probably like they want to, all that has to be completely rearranged to what it means now to be a follower and a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Have you and I lost our bearings? Have you and I have gotten maybe confused in our religion, in our position, uh, maybe in our success of seeing things happen good in the past, and yet now that too has maybe gone to our heads and we're embracing a, 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 a boldness, a pride uh, that is counter to what needs to be in our hearts and our lives to others, that we're more wanting to put people aside. Uh, we want judgment to come upon them instead of mercy and grace, these types of things. We too, do you need to sit on the bench? Would God say, come over and sit down with me for a little while. It's not a bad thing. The disciples are not losing their salvation. They're going to sit on the bench. Others are going to take it for a while and, 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 and carry out the, the kingdom work. It's okay to pull back. Jesus is wanting them to be reoriented. This same group would be those that would start the church we see in Acts. So Sitting on the bench may be the very best thing for us to propel us, but a definite change, a change of heart, a change of perspective needs to take place in our lives. We too need to re realize that after some success where Jesus has used us, that he's going to maybe introduce not staying where we are. We just may want to keep going and let always keep reliving the past in our present and keep that flow going. But yet Jesus 
ups the ante as it was, as, as it is to introduce cross, to introduce going to Jerusalem, to introduce being like a child, all these things that he now sets before the disciples, will they agree to? Will they adjust their hearts to? Well, to get there, some others needed to come and then do the work that they had first been sent to do. And so maybe for you and I, some others might need to step in. We need to come and get reallocated to what God is wanting us to understand of his heart and of his life. We're doing his work without a cross. We're doing his will uh, in a more judging, vindictive way instead of a caring, forgiving kind of heart and way. How is God leading you to step toward him and to sit with him on, on that bench to be pulled out of the game as it were, let someone else come on in and you take the time that is needed to get back to where God would want you to be. I would encourage each of us to make sure that we observe in our own heart where we are and at that time it's needed that we would agree to let someone come on in and let us sit with Jesus so he can get us back on his page. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for caring for us today like you did the disciples uh, years ago. Those first disciples, they were chosen by your Father. You stayed up all night in prayer getting them together of who they, they would be. And so you're wanting to continue investing in them, teaching. And yet, Lord, even along the way, maybe we're understanding that uh, they needed to be pulled, that they were no longer in that starting lineup as it were. But there were others that could come in. And uh, I'm sure that that blew them away uh, when those 70 others came back with just as much glowing reports as they had maybe some days or weeks earlier. So, Father, we, we know and we understand when you put your heart, your authority on anyone that we are definitely replaceable. And so, Father, we thank you that but your calling for us is still special. It's still important. And, but yet, maybe some time with you uh, and not in the middle of all the activity and all the things that we can let go of our pride. We can pull back and realize that there's a better way that others, and not judging, and these things the disciples had put on into their heart needed to be let go of. If they're ever going to be able to receive what Jesus had further to them to see and to know and to be a part of, there was a time that, as we see, took place. And maybe that's true for us as well. Help us to hear your heart and your direction for each of our lives. And we thank you that moments with you and our relationship with you, character that looks like you matters more than success. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.